Uh, this is the Community Scholar Program, and today we are going to have an interview with uh, Professor Yossi Chayes um, of uh, Haifa University. Um, before, we, uh, before we do, um, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, CSP, for those of you who might be um, Chayes fans uh, but don't uh, don't know uh, that much about CSP, you have to understand that the, um, the meeting today is brought to you courtesy of the uh, Orange County Scholar Program. Uh, this is a program that Ari Katz, uh, citizen, uh, concerned citizen, started uh, over two decades ago in Orange County, California. Um, and it has grown, it has blossomed, it has ballooned, so that today we have partners uh, from San Diego to, um, to, to Needham, Massachusetts, from Encino uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to New York. Um, there are a huge number of institutions who are affiliated, some of them your institutions. Um, if you want to learn about more events at CSP, go to occsp.net occsp.net to hear about more um, oncoming, uh, upcoming events. If you are not mute, please mute your, um, mute your uh, 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 Zoom right now because you are in for a treat. Um, you know, Kabbalah is always a, a subject of, uh, of tremendous interest, right? You could be slogging on about something going on in Jewish history, and you mention the word Kabbalah, and people's heads nearly explode off their necks, right? Their eyes open, uh, because we're talking about um, an area that's supposedly uh, forbidden, an area that supposedly keep, uh, uh, is the repository of the deepest truths within Judaism. So always very popular among Jews, non-Jews, anybody attracted to Jewish ideas are Kabbalistic ideas. But we know at the same time uh, that, that the visual display of any ideas, particularly the ideas of the divine, is, um, is anathema to Judaism. We've all heard about the uh, famous or notorious Second Commandment that prohibits uh, depictions of just about anything, uh, including and especially uh, the divine. Uh, we've been over, if you've taken CSP journeys with me before, uh, the fact that, uh, that the Second Commandment is fungible. It can be understood in a multitude of ways and has been throughout Jew Jewish history. But this sort of one serious dividing line has always been the question of the representation or the non-representation of divinity. So surprise, surprise, uh, when a fellow named uh, Professor Yossi Chayes who is the Sir Isaac Wolfson full professor, very full professor of Jewish thought at the Department of Jewish History at the University of Haifa, comes up with a book that you could just get. Yes, can you show the book? You can, you can get a hernia just lifting the book. He's a strong guy, he runs marathons, right? Comes up with a book full of imagery of the divine. You know, this is something quite, quite mind-blowing. Um, Yossi Chayes is interested in Kabbalah, early modern Jewish autobiography, women's re religiosity, history of Jewish attitudes toward magic, visualization of knowledge, all of these things exceedingly sexy topics, right? These are topics that really, if you would pick one person who's a public intellectual in the field of Jewish studies, it would be Yossi Chayes. But here's the thing about Yossi. Public intellectuals are uh, occasionally, nay, often dilettantes. And Yossi goes to the depth of the manner always in his um, research. He has been acclaimed as an author of several books funded by general, generous grants from the Israel Science Foundation and from the Volkswagen Foundation in Germany. Um, he's had Fulbright, Rothschild, Wexner, Hartmann, Katz Center Fellowships, you name it, he's got it. And in addition, he's conducted research at the Israel Institute for Advanced Studies um, and at the Goethe, Univers Goethe University um, and at the Jewish Theological Seminary. Now, why is this? Because not only is he interested in topics that are compelling, but he has the chops. He has the intellectual chops. He has the academic chops to go to the depth, to understand what he's talking about and to digest it in a way so that students of all kinds, 
from beginning to advance will benefit. And so it's a great honor to have Yossi Chayes here with us um, this afternoon to discuss um, Kabbalistic trees. Um, yes, first question, a very profound one. Uh, in scrolling the interwebs before my shrink told me that I had to be off them, lest I be, quote, a danger to myself and to others, um, I noticed that a lot of celebrities have tattoos of Kabbalistic trees on all kinds of mentionable and unmentionable part of their, parts of their anatomy. <laughs> So first of all, what's a Kabbalistic tree and why would I want to have it branded on my tuchus? Oh, yeah. a way to start with the hardest question of all, Mark. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, you know, um, I, 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 I was thinking that uh, might, might be a better profession for me, at least financially, to get into the tattoo cons consulting business. Mm -hmm. I, ha I do have quite a few tattoo parlors around the world that maintain uh, healthy correspondence with me, for which I have uh, never taken any remuneration. Well, it's time some, to start. Some silly reason. It's time I to need start. to take a, a master a class with you, consulting. Well, you need to take a cut. Um, the fact is that the, the, the ugliest phrase in the English language is botched circumcision. Um, the next ugliest phrase in the English language is botched Aramaic tattoo. But go ahead, Absolutely tell us. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. Um, I don't know why people put tattoos on anything, but that's just because uh, I'm a probably one or two generations too old to, to figure out the fascination. <laughs> but um, the Kabbalistic tree is an awfully nice image to, to choose if if one is going to tattoo oneself, I would suggest perhaps some some m muscle area that could provide the requisite pulsations, given the the appropriate gyrations to simulate the flow of divine shefa within the Kabbalistic tree, in order to you know to try and really vivify the yes. tree in its so, tattooed so, state. So the tree represents, you're saying, um, a, 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 um, the, the output and um, let's say the progress of divine energy from the very highest source to, to into uh, what we would consider to be our worlds, right? Um, that's what that is one, that's one, that's one, that's one aspect of it. Let me, let me back up for one second. And first of all, let, let me just say, if I can, Thank you to Ari and thank you to you, Mark, for agreeing to uh, to host me and to talk to me in, in a celebration, especially of this new book. And let me thank everyone here. I can't really even see all of all of you who are in the room um, because uh, it's so nice to see that according to my Zoom count, we're well over a hundred right now. And uh, I, I wish I could. I, I wish I had a way of uh, setting it so that I could see all the folks from Orange County who I enjoyed meeting and getting to know over the month that I was with you with my family uh, five or six years ago. But uh, it is nice to be back, and it would. Okay, um, I think that we need. <laughs> um, in any case, yeah, that was um somebody else's screen not mine yes, I, i've now disabled the but, ability to share screens uh, okay uh so yeah when i was when i was in orange county i was still uh in the midst of the research and hadn't even started writing the book and um and here i am a few years later and the book the first copy the advanced copy has just landed and that's very exciting for me um, let, now, just to your question, to make it a, a, a little bit clear, the, the, the book is about the Kabbalistic tree, but there is some confusion about what I mean by that, and it's built into uh, the subject, because uh, fu fundamentally, you have to make the distinction between a diagram, a tree diagram, or an, an arboreal diagram that's very commonly used by Kabbalists to represent the relationships between the spherot. Uh, the spherot are the constitutive um, 
I would say that the, the notion of the Sfirot is the constitutive notion of Kabbalah. When you're looking at some form of, uh, of Jewish esotericism or Jewish mysticism and you, you ask yourself, is this Kabbalah or is it something else? One easy way of deciding whether it's Kabbalah is uh, by seeing whether uh, the Sfirot are central to the discussion in, in, the, in the work. So uh, Kabbalists use this diagrammatic form, which goes back, as you know very well, Mark, to m the Middle Ages and, and uh, to sources that are uh, not at all Kabbalistic. It's kind of, you could compare it to pie, pie charts or Venn diagrams that we're used to in our own day, um, diagrams that do a, a, a great job of uh, representing information, um, but are that are very versatile and can be used to show many different things. Uh, the arboreal diagram has been used for many things uh, for the last thousand years, including family trees. And uh, famously, to students of philosophy, uh, Aristotle, Aristotle's categories of being, the so-called Porphyrian tree. So uh, when the Kabbalists began using that diagrammatic form to represent the relationships between the Sfirot, they were actually uh, calling upon a, di a diagrammatic form that was very familiar to educated people in the Middle Ages. Um, and uh, I guess the only thing I would add, add to that at this moment is that like, the, like a Venn diagram or a pie chart, uh, an arboreal diagram doesn't imply spatial relationships. It shows how concepts are related, what's central, what's peripheral, what overlaps, what's, uh, what's uh, prior in the hierarchy, prior in the causal chain, and, um, or, and of course, uh, the opposite. So um, I think one advantage that the tree had for Kabbalists besides the fact that it was a prestigious diagrammatic schema that uh, was used by scientists in the Middle Ages. So it was a very respectable uh, choice. But um, the fact that it didn't necessarily imply space, uh, I think was a, was a good thing in their, in their eyes. It enabled them to say, here's a picture of the relationships between these divine qualities known as the sefirot that uh, doesn't fundamentally uh, signify uh, a material or corporeal or spatial notion of the divine. So we're representing the divine without necessarily saying that this is what we think the divine looks like. Okay. So that's that's a word on the diagram itself. But my book and my research over the last decade has actually been focused on a, a genre of Kabbalistic creativity that has the same name. That's hence the confusion. When Kabbalists speak about the tree or a tree, you have to read contextually a little bit to figure out whether they're talking about a tree diagram that could be in the margins of a Kabbalistic manuscript, or if they're talking about an artifact that belongs to this genre called Kabbalistic trees. And um, again, my, my book and my research has been focused on the latter. And uh, the latter was classically defined as an arboreal diagram that was inscribed on a large parchment sheet. So it 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 has it's a, it's a kind of synecdote to call the to call the whole artifact a tree. The tree diagram is just a part of it. But what the what the medium afforded the Kabbalists was uh, real estate. Once you had the diagram not in the margins of a manuscript, but on a large sheet of parchment, all of the sudden it became possible to use that real estate to provide a, a wealth of information about the Sfirot, which again are the, 
is that the concept of this road is the constitutive concept of Kabbalah, meaning the when you want to introduce someone to Kabbalah, you teach them about the Sfirot. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that the earliest Kabbalistic ilanot, or trees that are uh, part of this genre, were, were first and foremost attempts to provide introductions to the Kabbalah that were mapped out in such a way that instead of reading a book that says this Fira has these qualities and these names, and this is what you need to know about it, that information could be inscribed on its location on the map, so to speak. So it became uh, a kind of uh, what uh, some might call a memory palace yes. to, to, keep, to keep straight all of the requisite information that a, an and uh, a student of the Kabbalah would would want to uh, master uh, when beginning this exploration of Kabbalah. So that's uh, that's so it, I, that's that's a very good summary. It's in effect, it's a machine to think with. Um, it, it's 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 an aid to um, both to memory of what what we've been taught about how divine energy flows through the Sfirot and the quality of the Sfirot. Um, it's a, we would call it a theosophical um, uh, aid, an aid to sort of knowing the nature of divinity. So my question is, and this is really more to the, to the second part of the, um, the first part of my question, you know, why are celebrities getting this tattooed on themselves, and also toward your other work, um, it sounds like this is, you know, very highfalutin, theosophical, philosophical material. On the other hand, some people regard Ilanot as a sort of amulet, you know, as a, 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 a sort, of, sort of, you know, a, a prophylactic or magically generative object that one should have on one's wall in order to contemplate, uh, or one should tattoo in the final analysis, right, in the extreme mm -hmm. on one's, um, one's body. Um, and so I, I'm interested in, as I always am when I talk about Kabbalah, um, in, in both the theosophical, right, the, the, call it the vertical contemplative aspects, and the horizontal, that is the sociological uh, and magical uh, implications uh, of, of this image. It can't simply be that, or it may simply be, or let me ask the question, is it simply that people keeping Kabbalistic Ilanot around as, um, as amulets or tattooing them on their body are, are completely ignorant uh, of and outside the pale of the uses to which actual theosophical Kabbalists put this material? Or was there a strand of the amulytic magical already present? Well, that's a good and compl complex question. Uh, I, I would say, um, first of all, that it's, it's, it's important to always bear in mind that uh, very, very few. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how broadly to make how, how broad to make this statement, but very few things have just one use. Um, and it's certainly true that Ilanot don't have just one use, and never, never had one use. So to say and that this is what they did or this is what they were for is um, no matter how you fill in the blank, you're going to be. Uh, dramatically curtailing what you ought to be keeping an awareness of. Uh, so I, I, I think I would begin by, by pointing out something that's very salient to your question, although you didn't specifically uh, push me in this direction, and that is that uh, it's, you know, the moment that I realized that the, that part of the definition of an Ilan going back hundreds of years when Kabbalists, uh, for Kabbalists the first definition I know of, of, a, of an Ilan that's offered by a Kabbalist in the abstract is by Moshe Cordovero in the 16th century. But Ilanot existed for at least 200 years before that. But part of the definition is it needs is is that it 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 be it be inscribed on parchment, and if you just think for a moment about uh, what Jews do with parchments, you realize that this is not. It couldn't just be a learning aid. It couldn't just be a manual uh, to uh, study 
rudimentary, you know, introductory treatises on the Sfirot. Mm -hmm. Every single parchment item used by Jews for over a thousand years has been a ritual object. Tefillin, mezuzot, uh, Torah scrolls. What, by the Middle Ages, if a Jew writes something on parchment, it's not, it's not for regular study, it's for ritual deployment. So to me, the, the first thing to say about the use of the Elan is that it, its very medium suggests that it, it's, it's used in a way that uh, we would call ritualistic, it's performed. Yes. So, um, and I think, you know, connecting to that, to say that, you know, I said, I said a, a minute ago that you could get an Ilan that would provide an introduction, an introduction to Kabbalah. But that's, again, only, I don't even know if, if it's right to say that it's half the story. It's just the beginning of the story, because the first thing that an introductory Kabbalist was, was um, curious to know was how to pray as a Kabbalist. So we often think of Kabbalah in, in, in very abstract theosophic terms, um, but realizing the centrality of prayer in Kabbalistic life, in the life, in the daily life of the Kabbalist is, I think, crucial to appreciating why Ilanot were important. These were, um, I, I don't want to say they were like a, like a mandala, but the, 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 the Ilan was an object that was useful to a, a Kabbalist in developing that Kabbalist's capacity to engage in Kabbalistic prayer, where you might use exactly the same liturgy that people are familiar with from the synagogues today. But it, I often tell uh, students that the Kabbalistic prayer book is like going to a movie with subtitles. But it, it's got... It's got subtitles. The subtitles in this case are uh, spherotic directions. You're saying what all of us who've been to synagogue are familiar with, but you're getting subtitles telling you that what, what's really being uh, engaged in the moment of prayer are these dynamic movements within the divine realm that the Kabbalistic practitioner is trying to uh, influence. Yes. So, 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 so this so, is a kind of magic. It's it is a kind of magic. Okay, I get it. And, okay. And, and, in fact, Julian Julian um, Lemo uh, says in the uh, he just texted me uh, a roadmap, perhaps. So it's a roadmap to the interiority of the prayer experience, directing what we call um, theurgically, right? Directing prayer to the right <coughs> to the right yes. addresses <coughs> and opening and closing the correct valves to be effective in prayer. So yes, here's the thing. It seems looking at this and, you know, I, I, I reviewed the book for, um, uh, for, uh, before for publication for the, you know, to, uh, for a blurb, it's a, it's an amazing book. And the thing that hit me immediately was this stuff is so central and important, but you know, and I'm a historian of uh, art made by and for visual culture, material culture made by and for Jews, you know, so I know something about Ilanot and I've seen them and we've talked about them, but why to most people, why have most people never heard about them before? Has nobody ever written about them before? How could such a central component of the Jewish experience as we see both in terms of theoretical Theosophical and practical, prayerful, be neglected so abjectly. Yeah, um, it's uh, it's just a fact that it that uh, blew my mind when I first uh, became aware of the genre, and I think it's also telling that I I lived most of my adult life and got my PhD like you at a respectable university and uh, you know, got tenure at, at my university and years went by and I had no idea about Ilanot and uh, I had been, uh, I'd spent uh, years of my life in the Gershom Sholem Library in Jerusalem, which is wallpapered with images from Ilanot, 
but never really asked myself what those were. And uh, when, when finally uh, a, a very close friend of mine, Menachem Kalus, was asked by a collector of Judaica named William Gross, who of course Mark knows very well, to write for him uh, some descriptions of the Kabbalistic content visualized in the Ilanot that he'd been collecting by that time, a little over a decade ago. He'd already been collecting them for about 30 years. Um, at Menachem's house, I saw uh, a four, you know, a printed home home printer pages taped together of Williams Ilanot, and I said, "What what are these?" And yeah. he said, "Oh, this is you know William Gross's Ilanot. Uh, what's an Ilan?" And he's telling me all well, these long scrolls. These were not exactly like the ones that you and I have been talking about for the last few minutes, but so-called Lurianic scrolls that are, they're, they're less like maps and more like timelines of the unfolding of the divine. And I said, what, you know, why have I never seen these before? Where, are they, where, where have these been hiding? He said, also, I don't know. I didn't see them before either. I don't know anything about them. Turns out there isn't an Encyclopedia Judaica article about them. There isn't an article about them. There isn't a book about them. At that time, Menachem had finished his PhD, but he didn't, he hadn't found a job. And I had a job and they were telling us, you have to get grant money, you have to get grant money. Right. And I, and I thought, well, if I get grant money, I can give Menachem a job. Right. And uh, one thing led to the next, I wrote my first Israel Science Foundation grant proposal. And I thought, well, I'll just, I'll apply for three years, I'll say, let Menachem continue what he's doing. And it'll be good for everybody. Uh, I still didn't really have a full idea of what what these things were. Um, now, if you want on on one foot, so to speak, for me to explain why I think they they were ignored uh, over a hundred years of scholarship, and also why people even outside the world of academic Jewish studies don't know about them, I would say very quickly a couple of things. One is that people doing Jewish intellectual history, cultural history, with my kind of background. Uh, were uh, preoccupied with texts, yes. not yes. not interested in pictures. Yes. And people doing art history, more from your kind of background, were looking for pretty illuminations on manuscripts, representational images, uh, to do the kind of work that you know that you did in your uh, you know your career and, and other art historians have done. Um, also, so uh, there there wasn't really. Uh, a natural place for someone an, a, in the academic world, in the Jewish studies world, to uh, to, t to take an interest in diagrammatic uh, visualizations of Kabbalistic cosmology. There just wasn't, and, and the same could be said for scientific scientific uh, imagery was also hardly studied by anyone until the 80s of the uh, 20th century for exactly the same reason. And outside of the academic world, I think that Ilanot are one of the last esoteric bodies of knowledge that people were reluctant to share publicly. They are the last kind of Kabbalah to be printed. And even when they are printed for the first time, one Ilan is printed in Warsaw in 1864. And... Uh, and then it w when it was reprinted in 1893, it was completely ball, um, it was gutted of 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 uh, of its uh, e even things like circles. They took they didn't want anything that was so they just made it a whole bunch of text jumbled together, completely lost its recognizable form. Um, so yeah, I think I think it was considered. Uh, dangerously esoteric and still inappropriate for uh, public uh, dissemination. Okay, so here, here's a question. So given uh, the fact that these things are so visually stunning, and I hope you'll see as we approach the half hour mark, you'll show us some of the actual uh, images if you're, if you're, if you have them to hand. Um, sure. I, can answer, I can answer for myself why um, why art publishing companies like Tashin, for instance, didn't take up uh, questions of Jewish art um, 
it was considered peripheral and, and sort of off the, uh, out of the interest of the general public. Uh, but, you know, looking at these things and given the interest of um, art publishing now in publishing esoteric images, it astounds me that uh, people didn't consider these things uh, perhaps visually compelling enough. Uh, I'm not sure. One thing I can say is I'm very pleased with the university, uh, with the um, Penn State University Press uh, and its uh, and its handling uh, of these uh, of these images because they've done a stunning job, and in fact are much more tolerant of extensive commentary on the images than an quote unquote art book uh, publisher might be. Uh, but still, it's 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 a big lacuna. And um, can you show us? Yeah, can you show us that switch back? I just want to just want to show you that they did a nice. You can't see anything on Zoom, I'm sure, but there are quite a few uh, gatefolds in this book, uh, which allow you to to at least get beyond what's still an oversized eight by ten page. You get basically four eight by ten pages to see an Elon a little bit better than you might um, well in a in a printed book um, so yeah they did it they did a really nice job as I guess about as well as as one could do the, the thing to bear in mind is that a typical uh, Lurianic Elan may be nearly a meter across but can be between three and 12 meters long I guess a meter is like a yard to, I'm speaking to Americans but uh, you can just imagine that it's very difficult on a regular in a book page to give a sense of these I think I, I, at this point it also uh, is reasonable for me to suggest that people have a look who are curious to begin this their uh, maybe their own study of Ilanot that uh, in addition to to availing themselves of the book, which really gives a thorough accounting of the genre, go to www.elanote.org, which I can put in the chat. Um, uh, and this is a very uh, beta, oh, thanks, Mark, a very be a beta uh, site. The end user interface has not yet been uh, developed or let alone implemented. But what you already have is the first fruit of the last uh, three years of creating uh, digital scientific editions of classical or pre Lurianic Ilanot, including okay. some really extraordinary artifacts. Yeah. Mark, oh, you got muted, Mark. Something happened and you got muted. Yeah, somebody told me to stop coughing, so I, I muted myself. Thank oh, you, John. okay. Um, so, uh, so uh, you spoke about classical versus Lurianic Ilanot. What are the differences in a nutshell? And also, wait, well, the I, classical. I, I on top of that, one second. Um, you talk about Ilanot being in in extended tree scroll out form, uh, but there are some, uh, as Rochelle Ambersound points out, that are made in the form of kind of labyrinths. So, could you address both form and content? Well, I mean, I'm not, I can show a couple of people want to see some pictures. So maybe I can do a voiceover on a couple of, a couple of pictures. If I can get this uh, to work very quickly. Last week I was in Oxford uh, talking to them uh, on the occasion of the 500th anniversary of their Hebrew manuscript collection. Um, and so I, I, I made this little presentation. I'll take a couple of images from. This is uh, a, an extraordinary Ilan that you're seeing. This is a classical Ilan. Um, and let's see, before, oh, hold on, let me make sure I have a, a I can, sh let me back up a couple. Th these are very old classical Ilanot that show you the form in its uh, raw original integrity, take, an, an, uh, take a, uh, an arboreal diagram, put it on a parchment sheet and fill it up with text that's placed appropriately on the parchment sheet. That's a, these are two, and the one on the left is from Brescia, in Brescia, and the one on the right is now in the Vatican, but they're both um, pre-expulsion era um, artifacts. 
And uh, this is a copy of an even older one, but the, the copy itself was made in 1607. Uh, and you see again, the, always the tree at the very top is a representation of Ein Sof, the infinite, that's the source of the tree. Uh, the candelabrum, the menorah, and the shoe bread table are often represented on the Kabbalistic, on the Ilan, in the classical Ilan, um, as, as um, I think, part of its, of its, the, the way in which it signals uh, sacred space and takes cues also from uh, the, the, the patterns that were established in the tabernacle and in the temple. That's a whole conversation in itself. This I didn't need to show you. But here, this is, uh, let me, this is, gives you a, a sort of scroll up on this magnificent parchment. This is Oxford's copy of the, uh, again, uh, an Elan that I named the magnificent parchment for various reasons. Um, it has a 33,000 word anthological text that includes um, selections from the Kabbalist's library as it was the bookshelf uh, that a, an Italian Kabbalist around the year 1500 might have availed himself of. And you can see the, uh, for those of you who can read Hebrew, you can probably make out now Ein Sof, the infinite that's inscribed in the eye above the uppermost of the ten sfirot, crown or keter, and uh, goes all the way down to Malchut, the tenth sphira, which is basically parked on, an, on a representation of the divine throne, which you, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the divine throne is pictured here just above the firmament that is just above the cherubs uh, in a kind of kind of homage to Ezekiel's vision. But it's not Ezekiel who's seen here among the cherubs, but Rabbi Akiva, who, uh, who's treated uh, to uh, considerable attention here in this magnificent parchment. And, and uh, they are, the cherubs and Rabbi Kiva are just above the zodiac that represents the, um, the cosmos that's, you might just say, below the divine realm. So this is, uh, I, I think it's fair to say, the most extraordinary of the classical Ilanot, and it maps out classical Kabbalah. It tells you, you know, what what, what are the Sfirot? What are their names? What are their appellations? How are they networked? How, how do the Sfirot communicate with each other? What are the channels? How do they, how do they uh, connect additional, uh, more abstract, Kabbalistic thoughts, reflections on the Sfirot? Um, and Kabbalistic ideas are found in that 33,000 word anthology. And okay. also it's quite interesting, awesome. yeah. How big is it? How long is it? People want to know. Uh, this is this is a, uh, about three meters long, Whoa. a little less than a meter across and about three meters long. And any sense um, of how, how long it took to create the thing? It's often unknown, but any sense? Uh, we, I, we couldn't say there in Leeds. There's a there's a fragment of this, a, a copy of the same that's incomplete, which I, I love because it shows you the scribal work in process that the, the scribe has already done most of the the drafting of the diagrammatic forms and has started putting in you might, what you might call the chapter headings mm. in bold in bold square script and only beginning here and there to fill in in cursive script the more detailed text so you get a sense of its formation um, and there are a whole variety of these they're really luxury ones that have uh, you know, beautiful colors, and uh, and then there are some that were clearly executed by scribes on the fly. Probably, uh, maybe I don't know if it's ironic or not, but probably some of the better copies were made by professional kabbalists who weren't necessarily the greatest uh, scribes and didn't create the most beautiful parchment. So we have. I mean, I've just noticed impressionistically that sometimes the most beautiful Ilanot have the worst texts, the most corrupt texts. 
they were copied by people who really didn't understand what they were copying. Um, so you have the, the, now I'm getting to your question, believe it or not, Mark, because the classical Elan is like a map. And what I wanted to say, and I did say already before, was that the Lurianic Elan is more like a timeline. It's more, uh, to use ac academies, language, it's more diachronic than synchronic. The, the movement within the classical Elan is, be, is within, the, within that figure, within the 10 spherot, the, the flow of Shefa, the flow of the light of the infinite. Uh, that's, you can presume um, that kind of movement or flow within, within the form. But the flow of the Lurianic Elan is actually mimetically propelled by your scrolling of this long rotalus, this long parchment or paper roll that can go literally more than 30 feet. Uh, and it begins at the very top of the world of Atsilut, of emanation, and can reach to the bottom of the world of Asiya, for those of you who know about the Kabbalistic four worlds. Most of the attention is, as you might expect, given to the world of Atsilut, or emanation, the topmost of the four Kabbalistic worlds. But these are um, dynamic, Move, moving images of the unfolding of the divine. And the image that you're seeing now on the screen that I've shared is central to the Lurianic Elan and copied in uh, the huge majority of them. I believe that we have good reason to believe that the, the idea for this image was, and or let's say the, the original image was likely drafted by one of the great Kabbalists of the 17th century, a converso uh, originally named Yaakov Tzemach, who came from Portugal and in, as, a, as, a, as an adult in his 30s, he acquired a tremendous amount of Jewish knowledge and became the leading Kabbalist in Jerusalem by the mid 17th century. Um, and he uh, created this image to to visualize perhaps the central concept of the Lurianic emanatory system, and that's a concept known as hitlabshut, or the enrobings or enclothings. And to uh, to explain what that is, simply just to say. Um, you know that the light of the divine is is presumed to be so intense that it can't possibly manifest in lower levels of reality without being hidden. Um, but that th that it's kind of like you know I live in in Israel near the power station, so you have you know the the electricity that comes out of the power station, and then it goes through all of these steps before I can plug my computer in in the wall here because I can't plug it right into the power station without blowing everything up. So the same with the light of God. And you, he, you see here the use of the arboreal form, but in this nesting kaleidoscopic mode, which is meant to suggest that the higher ones, which are closer to the infinite, to Ein Sof, and the lower ones, they all share the same basic structure, but the light of the infinite is enrobed in successively lower levels by the nesting of the lower levels of the higher trees in, in their analog parallels that are the higher levels of the lower trees. So it's like, uh, you know, well, you're, you're, you're basically seeing these parallels being made and each one of those trees is labeled as a divine persona or partsuf, which is also central to the Lurianic Kabbalistic system. So, you know, Tzemach believed that it was fundamentally important for people learning Lurianic Kabbalah to be able to visualize this step-down process of of engarmentation or enrobing of the divine light. And that's a central object of the Lurianic Ilan to show that.
speaking of distillation or enrobing, um, here's the thing. These are very lofty, sometimes abstruse concepts. Um, how do you suggest that people study Ilanat today? To what use should they put them? Well, um, I, I, you know, you, you remember that uh, book, uh, Nine and a Half Mystics? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, and he has a, the chapter with Sholem is called The Accountant. Uh, and, and he's and he's called the accountant because he says Sholem knows where where all the money is, but he's not allowed to spend it. In other words, he's a scholar of Kabbalah, but he's not a Kabbalist. But he knows where everything is. So, I mean, sometimes when I'm in a self-deprecating mood, I, I call myself an accountant, or I say my book on the Kabbalistic tree is uh it's an I've 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 been the accountant here. My my work now can point people in the direction of all of the material. I've been literally around the world in public and private libraries. Um, I can tell everyone through the book and through the website that I shared before what, what there is, um, but people will do with it what, what, what they will. And all, all I can say at this point is uh, that to my mind, the best way now for a person to become acquainted with Ilanot is on my website, ilanot.org, because uh, unless you have a, 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 a one-to-one uh, facsimile of an Ilan and are, uh, have the requisite skills to make sense of its texts and images, um, you, you don't really have a way. You don't really have a way into this material, but on the on this website, which at present only contains editions of classical Ilanot, we are. I just got funding from Volkswagen to spend the next three years creating uh, Lurianic editions, but none of them have uh, have gone online yet. Some of them are in progress, but none of them are yet online. But anyway, it doesn't matter because it's good to start with classical Ilanot. Everybody who studies Kabbalah should start with classical Kabbalah and then move on to Luriana Kabbalah. This is the way it's always been done. Now, and the, the materials on the website are already provide full Hebrew transcriptions and word and concept search capacities. Uh, the, trans the translations into English have been accomplished for almost everything on there, but not all of the English has been uploaded yet because it's very, it's a very technical process. So I won't waste your time explaining why, but hopefully over the next couple of months, everything will also have English translation. So the, and it's just like it's just like using a real Elan, although okay, it's very nice to hold these parchments in your hands. But at least on your computer, you can scroll, you can click, you can go where you will. One of the cool things about Ilanot is that they're not linear. They don't, you don't read them like you read a book. You kind of explore them like a, like a map or a timeline. They don't force uh, a particular path of reading upon you. So you can, you can just dive in and, and explore. Um, so, I, you know, I originally was going to put out printed critical editions of the great Ilanot, and I realized that that would, that would do terrible violence to these artifacts. And uh, although I'm not, you know, uh, com so committed to the digital humanities as the greatest thing ever to save, uh, you know, to save uh, the humanities and, you know, it's just, it's just uh, tools for us, but I think in in this case, uh, it's the it, it it really is the way to go. You you're when you look on that site, and perhaps I can stop this share, and uh, this is so fun on Zoom. Wow. Although okay, we're all a bit sick of Zoom, but anyway, if I open Firefox and I go to elanote.org here, so you can see this is the parchment that we were just looking at and you can see if i click on that eye of Ainsof, so wow. you can see cool. that you've got the transcription and then you have a translation 
if you've if you've gotten lost on the manuscript, you can say find locate on image and oh, go right there. Great, great. Um, and so it, you know this I this is the she wrote in the form of a wedding canopy, a chupa. Uh, every, everything you click, you get the transcription and you get the translation, and you also have already opportunities to search for uh, for features. Meaning, like you're, I'm interested in Kabbalah, I but I want to see visualizations of uh, I don't know, but, uh, let's say uh, the Tetragrammaton. I don't know. Let's see. So it says, so I can see uh, images, and uh, this is now more the the visual features, but. Okay, I don't want to. You get the idea. It's amazing. So that's so that's my answer. You study study the Ilano with the website, but but the website doesn't have the, um, you know, the information that you would want to orient yourself to the entire genre. That's what I provide in, in the, the book. book. And, and I have to say, I just looked the book up on on Amazon. It's a great book. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a printed book like that, even subsidizes a, a hefty price. So I have to ask you the Jewish question, Yas. Is there a- Can I get you a discount? Code? Yes. <laughs> Is there a coupon code that we could get a discount for the book with? I mean, because, because the folks in Orange County are, you know, my good buddies, I will, I will give you a code and every, anyone who uses it will, will get the book at 40% off. What? I won't see. I won't get any royalties, but you'll get a good price. You have to go to the press, though. You can't get it on Amazon. You go to the. I just put the link in the chat. You go to that. You go to the to, to their website and you put in Zoom forty as your coupon code, and you'll get the book for forty percent off. Amazing. I knew. I, knew uh, I, think, you're, I, I think you're. I think you're still allowed to go. To, if you're, I think you're still allowed to go onto Amazon and write a review. <laughs> So if you want if you want to pay me back for the forty percent off coupon, since I won't get any royalties, you can just write me a write me a nice review on Amazon. Speaking speaking of reviews, we have a few questions to wrap up with, and I'd I'd like to um bring them to your attention, Yas, because the way CSP Please. they they put things in the in the chat, right? Oh, okay, um, yeah, I haven't been able to look at the chat while we've been chatting. Right, so that's, that's okay. Um, so um, uh, there've been a number of questions. Um, are women included in this, or is this an all-male creation or realm? In other words, women as scribes, women as contemplators of, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, these are the most esoteric uh, works in the Jewish canon, you might say, and uh, they are very uh, text text oriented, as I, I just showed you in the magnificent parchment, the 33,000 word anthology of Kabbalistic literature from 16th century Italy. Uh, all of all, all of these uh, things that I'm saying now are meant to set up my uh, frank uh, 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 statement or assessment. Happened. Yes. which is that uh, Kabbalists were uh, were men and that, of course, you can find one or two examples of women mentioned as having some knowledge of Zohar, for example. Uh, we don't find women uh, among the famous Kabbalists. Years ago, you can find it in actually in my first book called Between Worlds. Um, I wrote I wrote about uh, women mystics in early modern Jewish culture. But one of the points that I made was you can call them Jewish mystics, you can talk about female Jewish mystics, but you can't talk about, uh, you know, women Kabbalists because there there weren't any. But but the male Kabbalists often were very interested in the mystical insights of their, um, you know, uh, of the women in their communities. That's something that I wrote about. But yeah, I'm I am sorry to say that uh, that only now with the women, perhaps even in this Zoom room, we, we may find the first women students of these artifacts in Jewish history. So welcome, <laughs> welcome women to the study and practice of Ilanot. 
Ali, Tali on um, Katz mentions that Cordovero named the female prophets on the tree as well. So that's, that's um, important. A couple of other uh, qu questions. Um, um, you, yes. Maybe I'm not sure about Cordovero, but she may be referring to the persona, the part Sufim of Rachel and Leah, who are uh, uh, always no, inscribed. No, Tali, Tali, speak, speak, speak. I unmute yourself and speak. No. Okay, no, I'm I'm referring to um, actually the research, um, and I've taught her class, created a course based on the Kabbalistic teachings of the female prophets, the seven holy women of Israel, and hmm. um, th that um, Isaac, uh, the, as Gloria, um, the result did the um, taking the seven names, the seven sephirot, and put it on the tree. Um, starting with, um, I'm talking about from Chesed Arnwood, the seven lower Sephiroth, yeah. and Cordovero used the names of, of starting with Chesed um, being um, Sarah, then going to Miriam, uh, to De Devorah as to Ferret, uh, Hannah Netzak, um, and then um, Hod is Avig Avigal, uh, Hulda as Yosad, Yosod, and uh, Esther Malchut. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm. I, I'm not. We. Th this is the kind of thing. Like, if we go, to, if we, you can already now go to the Ilanot portal. There, maps of God, and you can put in any of those names and see if uh, if they were inscribed on any of the classical Ilanot. Um, it's pos It's possible that some of them are. Or that there is an Ilan with all of the all seven. It's possible that that tradition never made it, you know, never crossed the barrier from uh, court from Codex to Ilan. But it's certainly true that uh, the classical Ilan wa was a uh, was an artifact that could aggregate more and more traditions. So as soon as someone had the idea that hey, there are seven female prophets, and we can f establish a correspondence between them. And the and the seven lower spheroth, hey, you know, bring it on, put them put them in there with the colors and the days of the week and the body parts and the male prophets and, you know, uh, you you just can oh, it's it's additive, cumulative, yeah. Okay, um, one more question. Uh, actually, um, uh, uh, Bimia has a uh, an interesting question: is why the focus on the top of the tree on the upper realms uh, when we exist mostly. She says, in the lower realms, I'd say in the realms connected with the lower realms or the realms kissed by or touched by the lower realms. Um, yeah, that's a, that I would I would say um, uh, two things. The uh, what I said about uh, the the four worlds, what in the t it's it's not quite not exactly the top of the tree. What what I was trying to say was that when uh, when people made uh, il uh, Lurianic Ilanot, they were primarily visualizing Lurianic Kabbalah. And Lurianic Kabbalah is primarily preoccupied with the processes that take place in the highest of the four worlds of Atzilut. Now, you could ask Isaac Luria and Isaac Lur and his disciples, why did they focus so much on the highest world when, you know, they, they didn't have good plumbing in Sfat? They should have just hired a plumber and, you know, taken care of, and maybe they could have lived longer if they had better sanitation, but they were primarily interested in the upper world. Um, and other kinds of scholars were interested in, 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 in uh, different things. So it's true that the Luriana Kabbalists had a kind of uh, aspiration to be able to say that, that their system could account for everything. It's sometimes called a pansophical aspiration. They wanted to, to know everything. And so some of the Lurianic Ilanot will extend to at, le at least in a very schematic way, all the way to the bottom of, you know, the bottom, so to speak, of our world. But be I, I, because it is fundamentally a representation of their cosmology, uh, the the lion's share of the space will always be devoted to the processes that take place in in the realm of divinity, in the realm of the spherot. Um, so, and that you know that's 
the specialty of Kabbalah, to, to, to know about what's going on in the divine realm and to presume that what's going on beneath the divine realm is a kind of microcosmic reflection uh, of what's going on within the divine realm. The divine realm can be influenced by changes in the lower realms, um, but, uh, but fundamentally, the, you know, the real action is taking place within God and within the highest world of Atsilut in their, in their view of things. Well, thank you, Yossi. This has been very, very enlightening. The book is exquisite. I knew from the first time I saw the draft that this is going to be um, the hottest title in Mark, academic Jewish studies of the year. And, Mark, um, you're like the mid midwife of the book, so. No, no, no. I'm the midwife of nothing. I wish I had such skill. Um, this is this is uh, this will be fuel for food for thought and fuel for continuing conversation. It is so good to see you all. And it's so good to celebrate the publication of this exceptional book. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at more CSP programs coming up this week, next week, the week after. Thank you so very much. Over and out from lovely Gypsy, New York, and Zichron Yaakov. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's been an honor.